Good afternoon and welcome to the first of two keynote lectures as part of a two-day forum of the Barbara and Norman Tanner Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy here at the University of Utah. This is an integral center uh, in the College of Social Behavioral Science uh, and one of our really dynamic out front programs where we blend theory, practice, research, community outreach, community change, all for the purpose of, the goal of, reducing propensity to violence when people disagree, whether it be with a spouse or across national boundaries. We are very, very proud and very pleased uh, to be able to present this program to you. The forum started this morning with a series of panels and discussions. We'll continue this afternoon. We invite any of you to join us um, uh, shortly after this lecture ends in the officer club. We are moving from definitions and concepts to causes, consequences, policy implications across several spectrums. Um, beautiful blend of um, invited distinguished speakers um, from, from across the country, across the world, some of our own faculty, and this evening we even have a panel of uh, community people talking about the local implications of all this. Um, so it is with great pride and pleasure um, that we introduce um, the keynote lecture for, for this noon. And the, uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Professor Dean Chatterjee to introduce uh, today's um, keynoter. Professor Chatterjee is one of our extremely distinguished professors of philosophy at the University of Utah. He is editor-in-chief of a forthcoming multi-volume encyclopedia of global justice and is a series editor on a series in, in global justice. His publications include most recently, Democracy in a Global World, Human Rights and Political Participation in the 21st Century. He is completing two books currently, one on the ethics of war and peace, the other on cosmopolitan justice. He's a member of the American Philosophical Association's Advisory Committee on Applied Ethics and has been a two-term member of the Association's Committee on International Cooperation. He's on the editorial board of several journals and projects, including the Journal of Global Ethics, the Journal of Social Philosophy, and the Scientific Committee of the Conference of the Idea of the World State for the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. That one just got added, and I'm sorry I stumbled on that. That was not naturally flowing off the tongue. I introduce you to Professor Dean Chatterjee, who will introduce our speaker. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Shela Ben Habib, the most distinguished scholar of our time for this important keynote address. Uh, I may note at this, uh, at this time that this is her second visit to our campus. The first time she came uh, was in 2001 for the Feminism, Multiculturalism, and Group Rights Conference that I did right here in this auditorium. So welcome again, Sela. Sela Ben Habib is the Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University and Director of its program in Ethics, Politics, and Economics. Before joining the faculty at Yale, she taught at Harvard in the Department of Government and was the chair of Harvard's Committee on Degrees on Social Studies. A leading exponent of critical theory and feminist theory, especially the blending of the two, she is also a leading voice in democratic and human rights theories, postmodernism, multiculturalism, and cosmopolitanism. In cosmopolitan theory, to my knowledge, she has been doing the most important work in mitigating the tensions between the cosmopolitan demands of human rights and the demands uh, generated by sovereignty rights 
rights to culture and rights to autonomy and self-determination uh, for groups. In her work, she combines legal scholarship, analytic philosophy, continental thought, and political theory, something quite unique in the field and that makes her stand out from the rest. She is the author of many groundbreaking and influential books, including Critique, Norm, and Utopia, a study of the normative foundations of critical theory, situating the self, gender, community, I'm sorry, situating, uh, situate, situating the self, gender, community, and postmodernism in contemporary ethics. And this book has been the winner of the National Education Association's Best Book of the Year Award, Feminism as Critique, she did that together with Nancy Fraser and others, The Reluctant Modernism of Hannah Arendt, The Claims of Culture, Equality and Diversity in the Global Era, and The Rights of Others, Aliens, Citizens, and Residents, which won the Ralph Bunchy Award of the American Political Science Association and the North American Society for Social Philosophy's Best Book Award. Most recently, Oxford published her new book, Another Cosmopolitanism, based on her 2004 Tanner lectures delivered at Berkeley. Her edited anthologies include Democracy and Difference, Contesting the Boundaries of the Political and the Communicative Ethics. Professor Ben Habib's books have been translated into 11 languages. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has held the Baruch Spinoza Distinguished Professorship in Amsterdam, Cathedra Ferreta Moraf Distinguished Professorship in Girona, Spain, and the Canada Bunch Distinguished Professorship in Valencia, Spain. She was a Russell Sage Foundation Fellow and will be a Fellow at the Wissenschafts College, College in Berlin as of January 2009 for a research sabbatical. Professor Ben Habib was the president of the Eastern Division of the American Philosophical Association in 2006 7. She has delivered numerous dist distinguished lectures, including the Gauss Lectures at Princeton, Seely Lectures at Cambridge, and the Tana Lectures at Berkeley. She has received an honorary degree from the Humanistic University in Utrecht, Netherlands. But I must add this last point. She is one of the founders of a very important new initiative encompassing Turkey, Italy, the European Union, and the Middle East, called Reset Dialogues on Civilizations, which will start in Istanbul this June. Just as her scholarly work sets the tone and direction of the future of the academic trend by moving beyond the confines of the disciplinary and geographical boundaries, likewise, this important new project will set the tone of another emerging trend, that of blending the normative and the institutional imperatives, this is something that's long overdue. So it's with great pleasure that I invite Professor Ben Habib to deliver her keynote here today, titled The Great Immigration Debate, Facts and Fictions, Ideals and Illusions. So. Thank you very much for that wonderful uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be uh, back here in uh, Salt Lake City. I want to uh, thank, uh, is the microphone not working? Uh, sorry, just one second. Is this better? Okay. I'd like uh, to uh, thank uh, Mrs. Barbara uh, uh, Tanner and her spouse Norman uh, C. Tanner for uh, uh, endowing the uh, Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy. It's very kind of you to be here in the audience uh, today. And I would like uh, to thank its director, George Cheney, and of course my dear colleague, Dean Chatterjee, who makes sure that I reappear here every five or six um, uh, years. Uh, the politics of migration has emerged as one of the most divisive issues in many countries of the world. In the United States, immigration discussions flow seamlessly into matters of national security, employment levels, and the health of the American economy, the threats to American identity and way of life, etc. This melee of untangled questions has created strange bedfellows. 
Surprisingly, right-wing isolationists such as Pat Buchanan and left-wing critics of globalization such as the New York Times columnist Paul Krugman join hands over the need to restrict illegal immigration, while advocates of open or at least porous borders find themselves in the uneasy company of Wall Street's editorial pages, which likewise support free movement of peoples across boundaries. Cosmopolitans and big capital join hands, while social democrats and national isolationists shake hands. The major parties in the US Congress, on the other hand, are unable to unite around a comprehensive immigration bill. The politics of immigration has scrambled traditional political alliances not only in the United States of America, but in many other parts of the world as well. As countries of the European Union grow together around the goals of peace and prosperity and create an ever closer union of, Europe, of peoples of Europe, hardened policies are put into place to control EU's borders. Beginning in 2000, Germany led the way in reforming its liberal asylum and refugee policies while also passing a new citizenship law which permitted the naturalization of children of foreign parents born on German soil. Furthermore, the condition of members of third uh, countries who are residents but not citizens of the EU has improved in the last decade through the passage of various bills bringing their rights and entitlements in line with those of EU citizens. Nevertheless, tolerance towards the plight of undocumented workers some of whom are asylum seekers whose applications have been turned down and who have been residents in certain countries like the Netherlands, for example, for 15 years, has only gotten much worse. They are being threatened by deportation. Peace and prosperity within the borders of the European Union has brought with its increasing indifference towards the plight of those from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Not a week goes by without some story of migrants from Africa or Asia perishing in the process of trying to reach the shores of the EU. Neither are such developments restricted to the resource-rich countries of the Northern Hemisphere alone. Migrations, whether they are undertaken by economic migrants or by refugees fleeing political, ethnic, religious, or other kinds of persecution, are now global phenomena challenging many societies in many parts of the world. Often, these countries lack developed uh, transparent citizenship and migration policies and thus leave their migrants in conditions of semi-legality without repatriation or naturalization. Resource-rich countries such as the United Arab Emirates, for example, employ millions of guest workers now from all over the Middle East and the Asian Pacific Rim. Within the developing economies of Southeast Asia, a complex system of migrant workers from Indonesia and the Philippines, as well as models of multiple citizenship uh, from nationals of countries like Taiwan has developed. To take another example, Israel, a country of five and a half million people, is now home to 700,000 guest workers, roughly, and their offspring hailing from Central America, Romania, Russia, the Philippines, Taiwan, and other countries. Given the religious foundations of Israeli citizenship law, a Jew anywhere in the world who returns to the land of Israel is entitled to citizenship, but the absence of any clear-cut procedures of naturalization for non-Jews, it is a matter of time before the situation results in grave socioeconomic problems. The dilemmas and challenges of migrations are global, regional, and local. These flow into each other. They generate complex patterns of interdependence among human communities and respond to pull and push factors of which lawmakers and social scientists often lack clear understanding. Most will be surprised to find out that the United Arab Emirates, as we heard this morning, Kuwait, Singapore, Israel, and Jordan are listed as countries with the highest percentage share of migrants among the total population. The United States, the Russian Federation, Germany, and France lead in the actual number of international migrants among their populations. Again, as we heard from colleagues this morning, uh, but let me repeat it for the sake of a more general audience this afternoon, it is estimated that whereas in 1910 roughly 33 million individuals lived in countries other than their own as migrants, by the year 2000 that number had reached 175 million. For 2005 the figure is estimated at 191 million. 
Strikingly, more than half of the increase of migrants from 1910 to 2000 has occurred in the last three decades of the 20th century between 1965 and 2000. Uh, but again, as has been pointed out this morning, it is still less than 3% or 4% of the world's population, roughly 3%, that undertakes migrations. Not to forget, there are 24 million refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced persons in the world, and as civil wars and ethnic violence grow, this category of internally displaced persons, which are individuals who do not cross national borders, is itself uh, growing and growing. Now, to ascertain such trends about migrations and cross-border movements, need not commit one to exaggerated claims about the end of the state system. The irony of current political developments is that while state sovereignty in economic, military, and technological domains has been greatly eroded, it is nonetheless vigorously asserted, and national borders, while more porous, are still there to keep out so-called aliens and intruders. The old political structures may have waned, but the new forms of political globalization are not in sight. As I wrote in The Rights of Others, we are like travelers navigating an unknown terrain with the help of old maps drawn at different times and in response to different needs. While the terrain we are traveling on, the world society of states has changed, our normative map has not. The growing normative incongruities between international human rights norms, particularly as they pertain to the rights of others, and assertions of territorial sovereignty are the novel features of this new landscape. And again, uh, just to remind everyone, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognizes the right of freedom to movement across boundaries, a right to emigrate, that is to leave a country, but not a right to immigrate, a right to enter a country. This is Article 13. Article 14 anchors the right to enjoy asylum under certain circumstances, while Article 15 of the Declaration proclaims that everyone has a right to nationality, the second half of Article 15 stipulates that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality nor denied the right to change his nationality. And these rights are also reinforced by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But the Universal Declaration is silent on states' obligations to grant entry to immigrants to uphold the rights of asylum and to permit citizenship to alien residents and denizens. These rights have no specific addressees and they do not anchor specific obligations on the part of second or third parties to comply, to comply with them. Despite the cross-border character of these rights then, the declaration also upholds the sovereignty of individual states. Thus, a series of internal contradictions between universal human rights and territorial sovereignty are built in to the logic of the most comprehensive international legal documents in our world and all normative and legal discussion concerning migration uh, tries to balance or navigate these two uh, contradictory um, uh, poles. Now, as uh, Saskia Sassen has pointed out, migrations occur under structured configurations of pull and push factors. Certain migratory patterns get established over time because of the economic interdependence of sending and receiving countries. So what I would like to do uh, as a, a first consideration in this um, lecture this afternoon is look at the discussion on migrations and a global distributive uh, justice. Uh, the second issue that I would like to look at is the discussion around migration and identities. I don't think I will have time to do anything but just mention the third issue, namely migrations and sovereignty. My purpose in this lecture is going to try to introduce to you uh, the philosophical debate around these uh, three and really more two uh, sets of um, uh, issues. So let us come to the debate about migrations and uh, global uh, distributive uh, uh, justice. But just to repeat, not everyone in the world wishes to migrate to every other place in the world. Migrations are often due to historical causes such as colonialism and imperialism. 
forceful acquisition of territories of indigenous peoples, the consequences of trade practices on populations across uh, borders. To express this prosaically, we are here, say the migrants, because you were there, or we did not cross the border, the border crossed us, and as our colleague Patricia fernandez Kelly explained with respect to the U.S., the United States relationship. What is then the contemporary philosophical discussion about migration and global distributive justice if migrations are best understood in terms of patterned interdependencies of pull and push uh, factors? The philosophical debate was uh, prompted uh, by uh, John Rawls's uh, claims in uh, The Law of Peoples of 1999. Uh, John Rawls wrote, an important role of a people's government, however arbitrary a society's boundaries may appear from a historical point of view, is to be the representative and effective agent of a people as they take responsibility for their territory and its environmental integrity, as well as for the size of the population, end of quote. Rawls adds in the footnote to this passage that, quote, a people has at least a qualified right to limit immigration. I leave aside here what these qualifications might be. In Rose's law of peoples, individuals are not the principal agents of justice, but are instead submerged into unities named uh, uh, peoples. There has been considerable debate in the literature as to why Rose would choose to develop a view of international justice from the standpoint of peoples rather than individuals. This methodological beginning point has led him to articulate principles of, of international justice, uh, not for individuals considered as units of equal moral respect and concern in a world society, but for peoples and their representatives. Who are the peoples in John Rawls's The Law of Peoples? The concept of peoples is introduced by Rawls as a device of representation, much as the concept of the moral person was in his theory of justice and that of the citizen was in political liberalism. A device of representation accentuates certain features of the object to be represented while bracketing or minimizing others. So it is with the concept of peoples. Rawlsian peoples are ideally defined as liberal peoples and have three basic features. Quote, a reasonably just constitutional democratic government that serves their interests, citizens united by what John Stuart Mill called common sympathies, and finally, peoples have a moral nature. Missing from this vision is an appreciation of the significant internal division of human societies along the lines of class, gender, ethnicity, religion, etc. This holistic vision takes the aspiration of liberal nationalist movements in their period of ascendancy and um, presents these aspirations as if they were social facts. But peoples are not found, not liberal peoples either, they develop through uh, history. To view peoples as homogeneous entities characterized by a clearly identifiable moral nature and a source of common sympathies is not only sociologically wrong, this view is also inimical to the interests of those who have been excluded from the people because they refuse to accept or respect its hegemonic moral code. Rose's vision uh, slides into nationalism. It should therefore come as no surprise that given this view of peoples and the model of a closed and complete society, migrations are not considered an important aspect of any law of peoples. Migratory movements for roles are episodic and not essential. Conditions of entry and exit into liberal democratic societies are considered peripheral in evaluating the nature of these societies. Now, Rawls stipulates several conditions for limiting migration on the part of democratic sovereign uh, peoples. And uh, in case you're asking why am I really focusing so much again on John Rawls, let's face it, this is the uh, most accomplished and still unsurpassed liberal democratic theory of our time, although we all have been criticizing it in the last couple of decades, it's still, I think, uh, the most articulated and comprehensive philosophical reflection that we must all um, uh, begin from. So what are the conditions for limiting 
migration that can be justified from a philosophical point of view for liberal peoples. First is a version of what is referred to in economics and other sciences as the tragedy of the commons. Unless a definite agent role of figures is given responsibility for maintaining an asset and bears losses for not doing so, a people's territory cannot be preserved in perpetuity for others. This argument then leads to the conclusion that there have to be boundaries of, of some kind. Notice that here Rose is arguing against radically open borders. That is, the tragedy of the commons says if there is no designated public agency that will take care of a people and its territory and its heritage, then in effect you will lose what you have. But this argument establishes that there may need to be some boundaries. It does not establish that there could not be, let's say, a porous boundary or some kind of immigration uh, policy. Rose's second reason for limiting immigration is, quote, to protect a people's political culture and its constitutional principles. And I must admit, this is one of the most shocking uh, phrases um, in Rose's Law of Peoples to me. Rose here seems to assume that immigration threatens a political culture and its constitutional principles. And he seems to take for granted that immigrants can be alien and unruly elements unlikely to be assimilated, socialized, or educated in the ways of a host um, country. Again, astonishing uh, assumption. Now, Rawls acknowledges that despite these rights to limit immigration across national boundaries, there is a moral duty to assist burdened societies. Liberal peoples can equip themselves of the moral obligations to, they owe to less fortunate societies through economic aid uh, assistance. And such assistance to economically poor and disadvantaged societies is expected to reduce the pressure of migratory movements on richer societies so that there may be a trade-off between increasing development aid, let's say, and restricting migration policy, which is something that I, I disagree um, uh, with. And so Rawls says, after having conceded that there is a moral duty to assist burdened societies, that, I'm quoting, it is not the case that the only way or the best way to carry out the duty of assistance is by following a principle of global distributive justice to regulate economic and social inequalities among peoples. Why indeed not? Having made this concession, why not go the uh, next step? As Thomas Pogge sarcastically observes, as it is, he says, the moral debate is largely focused on the question to what extent affluent societies and persons have obligation to help others worse off than them, some deny all such obligation, others claim but that it's quite demanding. But both sides take it for granted that as potential helpers that we are morally related to the starving abroad. This is of course true, but the debate ignores that we are also, and much more significantly, related to them as supporters of and beneficiaries from a global institutional order that substantially contributes to their destitution. So whereas Rawls claims that liberal peoples owe other less advantaged societies a natural duty of assistance, uh, his uh, critics and former students like Thomas Pocky and also Charles Byte say, we are interdependent in the world economy in a much more radical way so that you cannot uh, dispense of your obligation simply by engaging in uh, development, um, uh, development aid. Now, the comeback that Rawls has made in this important debate is um, around the concept of a system of cooperation. And bear with me, uh, because um, uh, the, I, the conference I know is a conference of a multidisciplinary nature, and, uh, the, but I do want to raise for you the moral um, and philosophical questions around this discussion about global distributive justice and uh, migrations. The argument is the, is the following. Rawls says, if the world economy and the world system, political system, is a system of cooperation, then we have obligations to each other that go beyond the moral duty to assist 
those who are poorer than us or burdened societies. So the burden of proof now becomes as to whether or not we can establish that the world economy is a system of cooperation so that we're not just talking about moral duty, but we're talking about an obligation of justice. Because if this is an unfair system of cooperation, then we have to rectify the unfairness inherent um, in it. Now, what is a system of cooperation? And can we talk about the world political economy as a system of cooperation? A system of cooperation suggests that the rules distributing obligations as well as benefits ought to be clearly identifiable and known, or in principle at least, knowable to all the participants. Whereas in a system of cooperation, there would be clear rules for distributing benefits and obligations, Rawls argues that the world economy is hardly the object of such clear and transparent judgments. Thus, global distributive justice principles, despite their cons considerable appeal, he says, do not have, quote, a defined goal, aim, or a cutoff point. Who is responsible to whom, for what, and to what extent? How much of our resources are we supposed to distribute? Now, this objection, uh, I think, carries some uh, uh, truth, uh, and it's not completely true, but let, let, let me try to state why. The world economy, or for that matter, any economic system, as I understand it, possesses features of cooperation as well as the logic of unintended consequences. Think, for example, of the stock market. While there are clearly defined rules of cooperation, at least in principle, as to how stocks can be bought and sold, as to how their values are rated and the like, at the end of the day, what makes the stock market work is precisely the logic of unintended consequences of millions of borrowers and traders. Once the rules of cooperation are established, no one can predict, and in principle ought to be able to predict, what results the market produces. Insider trading is regulated precisely because it skews the logic of unintended consequences by destroying the fairness of the rules of cooperation. Now, unlike free marketeers, I have no faith that the logic of unintended consequences is always rational or just. More often, it's not. Obviously, governments and other regulatory agencies interfere precisely to re rectify dysfunctionalities resulting from the simple play of market forces. But if we concede that the world economy is not a system of pure cooperation, but a mixed domain showing features of cooperation as well as competition, organization, and the logic of unintended consequences, what follows for the discussion around global distributive justice? The world economy then, I would say, while falling short of being a perfect system of cooperation, is one of significant interdependencies with non-negligible distributive consequences for the players involved. Within this system, there are public international bodies which have regulatory functions such as the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the Agency for International Development, as well as treaty associations such as GATT and NAFTA. Increasingly, these organizations have moved towards a political economical model of cooperation which could control and ameliorate the havoc that the logic of unintended consequences uh, uh, causes. Again, um, uh, Professor Patricia uh, is, is, talked about NAFTA and the unregulated consequences of NAFTA. Thus, I think that global justice theorists are right in demanding that these public bodies ought to be rendered increasingly accountable in their actions and transparent in their decision-making to their constituencies. Even if the world economy then is not a system of cooperation, precisely because it generates and involves interdependence, as well as being influenced by quasi-governing bodies, there is a great deal of room for reform here, which go well beyond the natural duty of assistance to burdened societies. And I would like to add uh, that I think that one of the major areas of future discussion in uh, the whole domain of global governance now is going to be the reform of the rules of the IMF and the WTO in accordance with human rights norms. And some of the practitioners within these societies um, are already writing about the compatibility of international human rights standards and their own, uh, their own um, practices. So we are taking some step, some significant step 
towards uh, structures of global governance, not structures of global um, uh, government. This debate, then, as to whether a global redistributive principle ought to be formulated as some version of a Rawlsian difference principle or in some versions of Poggé's egalitarian resource principle is not one that I wish to pursue further. Uh, I agree that with the liberal cosmopolitan vision that in a world of radical and not merely accidental and transitory interdependencies, our distributive obligations go well beyond the natural duty of assistance. However, I am uncomfortable by the imposition of a global redistributive principle to create economic justice among peoples, if it can indeed, unless and until the compatibility of such a principle also with structures of democratic self-governance is examined. I remain more convinced than ever that what is required is not only global redistribution of resources, although a certain amount of redistribution is absolutely necessary, but more importantly, a restructuring of the institutions of the world economy, both at the formal and informal levels, such that poor countries of the world can be helped to develop sustainable economies while participating in the world economy under fair conditions of uh, trade. One major issue today between the countries of North Africa and uh, the European Union, for example, is that the European Union has huge subsidies to its farmers and its uh, own uh, uh, cotton growers with the result that African goods cannot enter the European market. Now, here you are dealing with a question of fairness in trade, and it is clear that a certain amount of redistribution, particularly in the area of intellectual property rights, which concern medication, uh, to uh, poor uh, regions of the world, that that is crucial. But one should just not simply think that redistribution alone can solve structural problems where what you need is to create sustainable economies that will have the capacity to reproduce themselves over periods, uh, over periods of uh, time. Uh, to come back then to the question of immigration. Rainer Bauböck has perceptively written that, quote, the primary value of open borders lies in increasing human liberty rather than in increasing human inequality. If we assume that all legitimate government is based upon the intelligent allegiance of those who see themselves as authors, as well as subjects of the laws under which they live, then the right to leave a country is a moral right, without presupposing which the very concept of legitimacy would be nullified. It is this insight that has governed the tradition of liberal political thought, which has always considered the right to movement a foundational human right. A free immigration policy is crucial to the guarantee of citizens' freedom at large. Historically, we have sufficient evidence to show that restricted immigration rights, as well as denationalizations of citizens, and the unfair treatment of migrants go hand in hand with other authoritarian as well as totalitarian practices. So a fuller understanding of economic interdependence patterns of pull and push should make us also more aware of the specific historical constellations of obligation that people owe to one another. In the case of the United States and Central and Latin America, since the Monroe Doctrine, the United States has considered the Southern American Hemisphere as belonging to its domain of economic and security interests. Extensive political and economic involvement in the fates and fortunes of these countries over more than a century and a half has created patterns of migration and economic interdependence which no building of walls, I don't care how strong, how large, how long, how clever, can hide or make us forget. It is with a sober, factual, and non-polemical understanding of these facts that we must move towards a regionalist and interdependency perspective in solving issues of migratory movements across the US and Mexico and the US and Latin America more uh, generally. Once migration takes place and the immigrant has entered the new country, the citizenship and naturalization policies of each country ought to be subject to international human rights guidelines as well as that country's constitutional and legal traditions. 
Citizenship theory is not a theory of global distributive justice, although the two are interrelated, and the institution of citizenship is not the manner through which to address the world's economic disparities, again, although they are interrelated. Nor are citizenship and nationalization practices the site at which the world's redistributive problems can be resolved. And I don't want to be misunderstood here, and I know Dean and I are having a conversation about this. What I am saying is global distributive justice is absolutely crucial, but do not trade off between global distributive justice measures and immigration freedoms, because migratory freedoms are fundamental to a liberal regime in a different way than the question of global, um, global distribution, and that both at the normative level, citizenship theory and global distributive justice theories have to be, have to be kept um, apart. Let me now uh, briefly say something about immigration and uh, identities. While the debate about global distributive justice fires up the imagination of academics and intellectuals on the ground itself, what animates many more individuals is the perception of large-scale migrations as posing a threat to their identity. Even peaceful Switzerland was recently the site of violent clashes among groups around migrants' rights. Is there a way to approach this issue without repeating the tired juxtaposition of essentialism versus constructivism in identity debates. I will assume that collective identities are sedimented historically around practices as well as symbolic configurations, and that all identities are based upon distinctions of some form of us and them. The real issue today is whether we can view otherness today not as a threat, but as a constitutive aspect of our collective identity. Most modern states harbor societies which are complex, pluralist, driven along many lines of differentiation. Varieties of nationalism which had served to stabilize collective identities as well as legitimizing state power in the past are today threatened by the dual forces of globalization without as well as multicultural, multilingual, and multi-ethnic claims within. As empirical students of migrations will tell us, Today, transformations in patterns of migration are leading more and more individuals to retain ties to their home countries and not to undertake total immersion in their countries of immigration, if they ever did. The ease provided by globalized networks of transportation, communication, the electronic media, banking, and financial services are producing guest workers, seasonal workers, dual nationals, and diasporic communities. Migrations no longer bring with them the socialization in the culture of the host country or the e extensive socialization in the culture of the host country, a process poignantly symbolized for former generations by the assignment to immigrants to the USA of new family names in Ellis Island, for example. Today, nation states encourage diasporic politics among their migrants and ex-citizens seeing in the diaspora not only a source of political support for projects at home, at home, but also a resource of networks, skills, and competences that can be used to enhance a state's own standing in an increasingly global world. Notable examples of such wide diasporas are the large Indian, Chinese, and Jewish communities across the globe, where these communities retain close ties to what are called uh, mother or home country. Migrations thus have led to a pluralization of allegiances and commitments and to the growing complexity of um, nationals who today more likely than not are ex post and neo uh, colonials. Nevertheless, migrations are the site of intense conflicts over resources as well as identities. In the contemporary world, strong states militarize and increasingly criminalize migratory movements, the poor migrant becomes the symbol of the continuing assertion of sovereignty. Migrants' bodies, both dead and alive, strew the path of state's power. The increase in post-national fluidities of identities, however, can also come with a price, namely the loosening of the political and civic bonds between the citizen migrant and their polities. I do not share the postmodern view that the search for coherent identities is oppressive. 
nor do I believe that democracies can last without some civic attachment to their institutions, political traditions and practices, coupled with a critical understanding of past injustices on the part of citizens as well as migrants. The danger today is the growth of various kinds of tribalisms in the world, on the one hand, parochial attachment, and on the other hand, the move of the world towards a neoliberal utopia of worldwide capitalist consumers for whom civic republican attachments mean very little indeed. Most migrants, however, aspire to become citizens or at least legal resi residents of the countries into which they come. To be an undocumented alien or to be sans papier, as the French call it, is a form of civic death. The undocumented migrant is not a criminal. But as Hannah Arendt observed in The Origins of Totalitarianism in 1951, the stateless peoples of the interwar period of Europe, peoples without papers, preferred the status of being a prisoner to that of being without papers at all, since a criminal or a prisoner had clearly defined rights within just the justice system, while the undocumented or the one without papers has none at all. Today's recipient societies are failing to offer migrants a vibrant civic and political culture into which they can be socialized with dignity. And much of the anxiety about migrations is also the anxiety about some kind of wholeness at the civic core of many of the nations of the world. It's not that the nations, that the migrants are not being acculturated or integrated, it's also that we don't know how to do it anymore. In many European countries, it is assumed that certain groups of people are simply incapable of becoming French or German or Austrian. Ethnic nationalism has resurfaced in Europe. The best response to such attempts is still the one given by the philosopher Jürgen Habermas, I think, who distinguished between constitutional patriotism and other forms of ethnocultural identities. Can modern liberal democracies uphold constitutional patriotism and integrate migrants around these principles. We don't know. To do so will require a twofold understanding. First, recipient societies must be self-reflective enough about their own identities such as to distinguish between constitutional principles and institutions as distinguished from ethnocultural identities. Second, Migrants themselves must be willing to learn and to partake in the political culture and institutions of their host countries. Citizenship is not just an access to an economic bonanza, and it shouldn't be just the right who says this. It is assuming a social identity with its own rights and obligations. I find nothing objectionable in the requirement that a would-be citizen ought to learn one of the official languages of the country involved in Spain it could be Catalan or it could be uh, Castellano, but the Spanish government only permits you know, Castellano. But you have to be able to learn one official uh, language. That furthermore, there ought to be publicly funded language and citizenship courses that migrants could be expected to attend and that maybe even a citizenship exam would be required as it is in the United States. All of these measures in practice can be violated and can become a source of humiliation and disciplinarity rather than integration for future citizens. But as long as there are non-discriminatory, publicly accessible and publicly funded channels for the legal and transparent naturalization of migrants, we should welcome uh, such um, uh, practices. Uh, I am exceeding your patience. I will just briefly mention something about sovereignty and then I will uh, conclude. Migrations are always interstate uh, processes and we know that the current international legal system rests on the principle of state sovereignty and in effect the control of migration is considered one of the chief marks of um, uh, sovereignty. Now, it's been pointed out that, um, in effect, uh, the principle of sovereignty is both one of control and it is also both one of legitimacy. But contemporary political philosophers ask us if, in effect, we are living in an era 
of uh, extreme interdependence and the uh, global, uh, the world economy is a system both of cooperation and the logic of unintended consequences, then why should we take sovereignty as a moral measure of anything? Can we think beyond sovereignty? The first philosophical approach claims that it is morally arbitrary to think of the state as a container as if all morally relevant actions and decisions could be circumscribed within national borders. From a normative point of view, decisions ought to be reached by all those whose interests are affected by them. We ought to replace the norm of sovereignty with the norm of affected interests, and we build communities of deliberation and decision according to the norm of affected interests. This is one answer. The second approach is more pragmatic and advocates that different communities of representation may be involved in facing different problems. Uh, that the frame of representation, the who of justice, should be dependent on the matter at hand, the what of justice. For the purposes of immigration, this really means that the most intelligent debate about migrations ought to take place among interdependent communities on both sides of the border, that the what of justice should lead to an adjustment of the who of the frame of justice. The third approach, and the one that is most radical, argues that the unilateral control of states' borders is no longer an expression of democratic self-determination, but rather an act of oppression towards all those who are, whose interests are affected by such decisions. The unilateral domestic right to control state boundaries, it is argued, contradicts the principle of popular sovereignty. The regime of boundary control must be justified to foreigners as well as to citizens via institutions in which all can participate. Now, each of those solutions presents its own difficulties, and I will deal with them on the occasion of the publication of the paper uh, for this um, uh, conference. So let me conclude by saying, the great migration debates of our times are the tip of the iceberg for a set of much larger changes in the world at large, be it in the economy, be it in our collective identities, and be it in the principle of sovereignty which has governed the state system since 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. But criminalizing migrations is the solution neither to the world's economic problems nor to the crisis of identity within the nation state. We need solutions that respect the rights of others while also refusing to compromise on the right to free movement of the uh, peoples of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for another <coughs> superb lecture. It was, uh, um, I have been rereading roles recently, and I think that uh, pointing out the, 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 the tragic uh, depiction of the law of peoples over the individuality, as you said, shows the greatest, uh, the greatest flaw in, in, in that extraordinary book. Um, my question has to do with the category which with, you ended, with which you ended, which is, uh, the transformation of uh, the, the thinking about immigration into a, categoric, a category which the European Union, of course, has incorporated to great success uh, with regard to the peoples of Europe, and that is the, uh, the freedom of movement. And putting it in your last words about the right to the freedom of movement of a citizen in the world changes, it seems to me, very much the parameter on all accounts, whether it's sovereignty or global discrimination or distribution of resources, vesting as it is um, uh, uh, an apparently um, 
an apparently elusive dimension of freedom of movement into a right that needs to find the structure that will allow it to develop as uh, the ECJ has developed with regard to the uh, Article uh, 58 of the original Treaty of Rome. So my question is, doesn't the change of uh, the category of rights from one where one is dividing between uh, the absolute right of exit and the limited right of entry uh, is not its subsumption under the right of freedom of movement, the departing point for a possible bringing together of the dilemmas that you have adumbrated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chibli. Um, when um, you look at uh, a, a globe, uh, you know, if you, know, you have children and you're teaching them geography, history, or whatever, if you look at a, at a globe, right, we used to have a physical, there is a physical globe, and then there, is, you, there used to be in my childhood what was called the political map of the world, right? The physical, you know, shows you the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, and so on. The political map of the world always contains those little red or blue or blue uh, dots. When you think of it, every right to immigration has to be a right to immigration. Where is it that you go? You know, it's like, where do I go? You know, if I cross this border, I am on your land, right? This is the way we have divided the world up, and this is the way, you know, we've been sort of muddling along, you know, with this, uh, with this um, uh, system. Now, uh, we have an example, at least as far as the countries of the European Union are concerned, the 27 right now, uh, the emergence of some kind of, you know, structure where freedom of movement is uh, uh, guaranteed, respected across state boundaries, but there is still also labor market regulation. I guess the question with which I'm struggling in this paper, and I've been struggling for a long time, is the interrelationship between migration rights considered as uh, constitutional, juridical, international human rights guarantees, and the economic issues, economic issues uh, involved. Because I'm resisting the temptation to subsume migration simply under distributive justice. I don't think it can be done. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the question always uh, arises, what about <laughs> limiting migration on the basis of labor market requirements? Now, historically, we should point out uh, that countries have limited migration for the kookiest and silliest reasons, most of which are really racist. If you read, you know, the citizenship and migration categories of, let's say, a country like uh, uh, France, after the Algerian War, there are two categories in French law, uh, those uh, born uh, within France and those born uh, outside, whereas in the United States, categories of uh, racial heritage, the octagon and so on, have dominated, um, you know, these categories of characterizing the migrant. So each country's history uh, is reflected in these uh, uh, migratory issues. The, the question that everybody now, I think the question a lot of uh, kind of is facing is, can you use labor market regulation as a self-determining government? as a ground for controlling immigration? And is there a normative, is there a normative, is there a philosophical answer to that? My answer, the one that I'm struggling towards in this paper, is actually the answer to say, first of all, understand before you try to regulate. What are you trying to regulate? What are the pull and push uh, factors? Why is this happening? To give you a, an example again from Europe, but think of analogies with New York. In all the time that I spent in Germany, and I lived in Germany for close to 10 years, I would notice, for example, that in the universities, when the university service came to clean our offices, it was always either Turkish or Yugoslav workers. I never, ever saw a German worker in that position. And you know what? Send all the Turkish and Yugoslav workers home, 
you will not find a German worker because the German workers are unionized and they will want better jobs with better guarantee, with better pay, better security. We have similar debates, you know, that go on, that go on also in this country. So I find it very, I find it uh, very difficult to offer a single formula, but uh, I find myself insisting again and again on understanding patterns of interdependence. Again, Patricia was talking about NAFTA. One of the consequences of NAFTA, if I understand it correctly, is that it has destroyed large parts of a local Mexican corn production. That because the United States has better strains of corn that are treated better, that in effect a lot of corn farmers in Mexico are out of business, and guess what? They're coming over here. Now, what have we done, and why have we done what we have done? Right? So before we talk about labor market regulation, I really think that there is a great work that we have to do as intellectual social scientists of enlightening the public discourse in this country about you know, these complex interdependencies. So I'm afraid I don't have a formula there, but um, basically I'm saying that labor market regulations, if they are simply unilateral actions without a comprehension of the complexity of you know, uh, the way in which these mechanisms work, it's going to get us, uh, to get us nowhere again. labor market question that free movement raises is uh, what some people call the brain drain question and the interplay between free movement and the uh, creaming of professionals, um, physicians, um, other healthcare workers and so on from impoverished areas of the world. And I wonder if you have a comment about that side of the clash. Well, I guess I'm an example of that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to, to pay back in small ways whatever you know, I owe my own, my own uh, um, uh, home country. Um, of course, uh, this is, this is a, a major, uh, major issue, and um, you know, there are some interesting uh, programs, uh, for example, the Fulbright uh, Scholarship sometimes oblige. Uh, the professional or the academic to go back uh, for uh, for two years, and it doesn't always work, you know, for the best of everybody's life. But uh, clearly, uh, right now, you know, what we have seen, and maybe Dean can correct me here, India seems to be a very successful example of a country that has developed a sufficiently strong electronic sector that, in effect, not all brilliant Indian computer scientists are in uh, California. And they're not coming to Germany either, although the German government tried to bring them in. <laughs> you know, it's not happening. But you know, how to build that up and how, what kind of investment you have, that is, that is a, big, a big area, you know, uh, sort of science and technology uh, aid uh, into, into other, um, into other uh, uh, countries. I don't know if this is happening here. Just one more point to add, but uh, my university, Yale, and many on, on uh, New England area universities, not Harvard, but certainly NYU and others are now beginning to open campuses directly in the countries involved. So Yale is opening about 50 campuses in China. There is an effort to open a campus in Abu Dhabi. Uh, NYU is you know, opening campuses also uh, along the Gulf Coast. And I mean, these are complex. But when we think about it as academics, it's going to be a drain on our resources. But it is a way of um, significantly transferring scientific technological know-how, not by plucking the best and bringing them here, but going over there. It's, it's a different model right now. Uh, thank you very much for a multifaceted thought provoking lecture. I'm an economist, so when you started talking about uh, unintended consequences of market exchange and characterizing stock markets, my interest peaked. Uh, you see, most economists would think that uh, while the outcome is not always predictable, uh, it's hopefully intended, right? And 
my sense listening to you uh, was I, prob I thought probably the, the important issue is the asymmetric effects of market exchange. So I was waiting to see if you were going to get to f the effects of free trade. Effects of? Free trade. Uh -huh. uh, but you didn't. I think that to me is the central issue for the following reason. Uh, if you take something like NAFTA, right? Uh, the displacement effects of NAFTA on Mexican peasants was unintended. But that's only one part of the coin. There were also a lot of intended outcomes. So that's why I feel the, the important issue is really the asymmetric effects of trade. And my question to you as an economist, to a philosopher is, uh, What's the moral obligation here in terms of the displacement effects of fair, whatever that is, but equal free trade? I mean, that seems to be the real issue. Um, let me understand, understand the question. I mean, um, is the question then that um, you do not see that there is a moral obligation that we may have to the Mexican farmers who are made unemployed, who lose their land as a result of the NAFTA and the introduction of the strong uh, vein of uh, American corn. Uh, is your argument then that, um, uh, yes, you signed on to this, uh, you may not have realized this, but why should there be a moral obligation? Intuitively, okay, and I'm, you know, uh, intuitively, I think that, um, again, there was a very good argument that Patricia made this morning. How can one not know that uh, uh, free uh, flow of trade and capital would have consequences for labor markets? That, in effect, that you can't just, like, you know, free and try to, you know, open up one without also understanding that it may generate other other consequences, and of course, you, you are not talking about um, equal, um, you're not talking about partners with equal bargaining power at the table. I mean, right, there's a power asymmetry. I think that may be what you're also getting at. I mean, in many ways, of course, uh, both Mexico and, you know, let's take, you know, Turkey. I mean, you know, our country, you and I both know that in the 1950s, the Turkish government solved huge problems of the um, unemployment in the countryside and urbanization by signing off migrant workers to go to Germany. It was beneficial, of course, at a certain point, but it was also they were not protecting adequately the rights of their workers, and it's only now that the question of foreign remittances has come up the way it is coming up you know, with the Bracero program, for example, for Mexicans. So you have, I think, two things. I mean, you have governments that are not equal in their negotiating and bargaining power when they sit at the table. You have governments that are resolving their own problem via these bilateral agreements, in some cases multilateral agreements. And then I think you, know, you have the economic uh, question of uh, uh, could you really have seen the consequences of your action? And if you have, I think there is a moral obligation. The problem is free trade. Okay, I'll ask. I have one more 